peculiar thing about this document. It was never notarized. Well, and the thing, here's the thing. If people would be realistic when they're talking about the BRICS, then it wouldn't be such a big deal. But all year, it's been that the U.S. is in decline. The rest of the world has now decided that they are going to, you know, emancipate themselves from the, the U.S. empire. They're going to launch this gold-backed currency. And it really is a true this time that, you know, it's the end of dollar hegemony. Um, they're only going to trade amongst themselves and they're going to use a gold backed currency to do it. And therefore this is the year that the dollar starts to decline into, you know, the ether. And listen, this is, I mean, the BRICS are a very big part of the world and they have very large economies. They have a huge percent of the overall population. The, the, the growth rate of their GDP is higher than much of the Western world. So yes, of course you have to pay attention to this. And when they get together, you need to listen to what they're saying and the policies that they're advocating. But what you don't have to do is think that this means that the, you know, the U.S. is going to burn to the ground and they are going to magically rise and take over, you know, the, the way the world works. And that's why I push back on this so hard is because people just jump to these ridiculous conclusions, you know, and, and they will... They will highlight all the bad things in the United States and the corruption and the, you know, the, the election interference and all this kind of stuff, right? But yet, let's remember who we're talking about here, right? We're talking about Brazil, who's had a few scandals in their existence. We're talking about Russia, who's, you know, not exactly known for the most libertarian of ideals. We're talking about the Chinese Communist Party, which, you know, again, they still have internment camps for certain pop portions of the population and they're not exactly known for you know uh, a lack of coercion on their side and we're talking about south africa who you know the power goes out almost as much as it goes out in puerto rico so you know let's keep it in a little bit of you know reality here you know and then of course they 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 they're adding you know apparently they're going to add saudi arabia and that's going to really do it this time because saudi arabia you know they never cut people up in the back of you know, of embassies and carry them out in body bags or anything like that, you know, so they've got clear moral authority. And so it's just, it drives me crazy when people think that the sins of the United States automatically bestows statehood, sainthood on the rest of the world, because it just, it isn't like that. Um, and I, again, I have no problem with people pointing out the, you know, the negative aspects of the United States and all the mistakes we've made. But then to automatically assume that it means that these other countries who have an enormous amount of problems of their own are just going to automatically be able to do something like, you know, ditch the dollar, even if they chose to do so, it's it's just not reality. And so what I, what I try to do is push back on this and bring a little bit of sanity to the conversation. And of course, then people think that I'm being mean or I'm being rude. And, uh, you know, that, 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 that's the life of Brent Johnson. Yeah, Brent, you got to work on your social skills. Um, <laughs> so when we started doing this, we we made a point that it, it wasn't going to be the, the, the weekly milkshakes show. Uh, I think we've been doing a really good job of that. But when you get into something like this, this BRICS summit, it really does bring out all this lunacy. And I think you what you just said was such a great introduction to the topic because it, it shows this isn't anything by any means that you're taking personal. You, you, again, it's you're being as agnostic as possible about how the, the world could potentially unfold. But when you really look at the chess pieces, you got to be more realistic about, you know, the game afoot. Yeah. And, you know, and I think it's really important to understand both sides of the argument. Um, and so literally when I went to George Gammon's conference earlier this year, I gave a presentation and the first 35 slides of my presentation were why the BRICS were going to dethrone the, the United States and the dollar. And uh, I, you know, I went through every bullet point of their advantages and why they shouldn't be taken lightly. But, you know, then when you measure it against the other side of the argument, it, it's just not quite there. Um, you know, and, and, and it's, it's one of those things where, you know, and I know we keep coming back to this. I'm probably going to say it every episode if I remember to say it is investing is not about what you want to happen. Investing is about what's actually going to happen and in increasing the value of your portfolio. Now, if you want to go change the world and you want to make decisions that you think will lead to a better world, then that is totally fine. I think that's very honorable. And 
you have my full support. But that's not the same thing as trying to increase the size of your portfolio. It might be, it can be, but it doesn't necessarily be the same thing. And you know, where I come at it, uh, both in my job and on this channel is from an investment standpoint, right? That's what ultimately this show is about. It's about financial markets, where the world is heading and how to increase your personal wealth and portfolio. And, you know, I have a fiduciary t duty to do that for my clients, regardless of where, where I like things are going or not. So if I were to start investing my client's portfolio based on my personal moral compass or based on my personal political views, I would be in breach of my fiduciary duty. And I think if people would look at their own portfolios with that same um, kind of uh, lack of emotion, uh, I think in many ways it would help them. Um, you know, now it's great when what you want to see happen aligns with the facts that you think are actually going to happen. Uh, but I think it's very important to distinguish between those two. So anyway. Certainty is some something that we try to uh, get people to walk back from the cliff on. Um, some of the other things we've kind of jingled around with is that um, the inevitability does not necessarily mean imminent. The uh, you know popular vocabulary words that we've um, pushed or tried to push people away from are things like should and never. As soon as you start putting those words into your investment vocabulary, you find yourself in, into some trouble. Uh, I think the you you've said before, and and I would reiterate that the last couple of years, one of the great things about things alternatives like say Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency markets is it's educated a whole new population on how the monetary system works. But again, you know when you take some of those ideas and the potentiality that Bitcoin could do whatever everyone hopes it will do you're playing that should and you know that inevitable um is not as the same thing as imminent type of philosophy and you can get yourself into trouble one of the things i've noticed this week when you've talked about the bricks and and, and kind of been back and forth with people is uh and we've talked about this before but it'd be fun to highlight it here again is this idea that you know, now you kind of have this coalition. It's not just the bricks, it's how many letters do you want to stick into it. And so at any point, they're just going to flick the switch and stop using dollars. And especially the Saudi Arabia thing, it's like, ha ha ha, the petrodollar's over. Um, not to mention, you know, we're the one providing military defense to them, but that's a whole other conversation. So explain again the, the, the pain that would be caused and, and, and why these participants in nation states you know, having the impact of the euro dollar market and, and the various investments they've made with dollars, why just a flick of the switch is not going to be the end of the dollar without significant pain. Yeah, and the way the, the, it's, it's very important to, to, to kind of understand this. And, and, and the way I'll set this up is I'll, I'll reference a tweet that I sent out is so yesterday after the BRICS meeting was over, I sent out a tweet that highlighted the most important sentence from the official communique of 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 the meeting and it, you know and there was a sentence in there that said you know we are going to work together to explore the possibility of no longer using the dollars for trade amongst members and we're going to set up uh, facilities to you know encourage the trading in local currencies you know and that's that's very negative for the dollar obviously and uh then i said no just kidding that's from 2010. and that sentence that i highlighted is literally a sentence i pulled out of the official communique at the end of the BRICS meeting in 2010. So they've been talking about this for a long time. Um, and again, you know, a week or so ago, I, I, I put out a, a little picture of uh, Lucy holding the football, you know, and I called this the BRICS backed gold currency. And Charlie Brown is the US dollar fatalist. You know, he's really going to kick the field goal this time. And then every year, you know, they pull that back and say, well, we're not actually doing it. And here's why they're not actually doing it. First of all, no country, I don't care what country it is, certainly not the United States certainly no country in the West, and especially not Russia, China, Saudi, nobody wants to, no government wants to give up control of their currency. Now they might eventually have to do it, but nobody wants to do it. China already has a managed currency that they manage themselves. You think that Xi Jinping, one of the greatest strongmen of the last hundred years, wants to give up control of his currency when it's one of the biggest levers that he has? You think Putin, you know, arguably one of the biggest 
strongmen of the last hundred years and has been running Russia for the last 25 years. You think he wants to give up control of his currency, which is one of the biggest tools that he has? No country wants to do this. It's Saudi Arabia. You think they want to give up control of their currency? Their currency is pegged to the dollar so that it provides them stability. You think they want to give up control? No, they, they don't want to. And, and that's the first reason why it is very unlikely that they go to a gold-backed currency. Okay. Now, I'm not saying it can never happen, but it's just, it's not preferable, right? Okay, so then the other thing is the idea that, you know, they just stop using the dollar and there's no ramifications for them and there would only be ramifications for the United States, again, is completely wrong. You've probably heard this concept or this this quote over the last several years, you can't taper a Ponzi, right? Once you start pyramiding debt on top of debt, you can't really taper it because it's a system that has to grow in order to not crash. And so that's often attributed to the United States because, you know, we've run these budget deficits and we've taken all this debt and we can never pay it back. 100% true. The, you cannot taper a Ponzi and that's why the U.S. economy and the, the way the U.S. monetary system is designed has to keep growing and why it will probably eventually lead to either the inflation of the currency or a crash of the system, right? Okay, let's take that as a given. That also applies to the rest of the world because they use the euro dollar market and the euro dollar market is even more leveraged and an even bigger Ponzi scheme than the United States. And that system, the, the money in that system is not owed to the United States. It's owed to themselves. So it's Turkey owing, uh, you know, owing it to France or it's the Philippines owing it to Japan or it's Russia owing it to you know, China or whoever it is. And so if they just stop using those um, and they get rid of all their US dollar liabilities, then they are also getting rid of all their Euro dollar assets. And Euro dollar assets are a huge part of the assets of the BRICS and all of the rest of the world's countries. So until they can all agree on exactly what kind of currency they're gonna use, who's gonna build it, who's gonna in implement it, and who's going to enforce it, it's all kind of a pipe dream. Now, I'm not saying that this can't eventually happen. It can, and it probably will, but it will ha it will be a tremendous amount of pain to do it. And there just hasn't been nearly enough pain. And and for the BRICS to, to, to stop using the dollar, get rid of their biggest customer, and all of a sudden implement this system that also destroys their own assets, it's just really, really hard to do. If they could do it without the pain, they would have done it 15 years ago. And so just think about that. You know, it's one thing to say that I'm gonna get up every morning, I'm gonna run five miles, I'm gonna come home, I'm gonna work out two times a day, and I'm gonna be Mr. Olympia, right? It's not easy to do. It's one thing to say that it's really, really hard to implement it. And even if you do implement it, you kind of have to have the genes of Arnold Schwarzenegger to pull it off, right? And so, you know, there's one thing is uh, desire, another is uh, is the ability, and you know it's just, it's really really hard, and so that's kind of why I push back on this, and you know I try to do it a little sarcastic, I try to kind of be funny, I try to you know throw up these you know different analogies to kind of simplify it and and make people understand, and you know I think I've gotten through to some people, and I think I think it's helpful people. Obviously, some people think it's me being mean or me being a, you know an asshole or whatever it is. Um, but I think it's because when you try to use a little bit of logic and reason and a little bit of tempered emotion when discussing these topics, people who feel very strongly about it in an opposite way and in an emotional way, it's kind of like Trump derangement syndrome. They just, they just can't have it, you know? And, and, and the last thing I'll say is, ex and, you know, when I was in St. Bart's last week and I was talking with Jeff and George and Hugh and all these, all these guys, and we're talking about the, the system is. We, we are not advocates for the system. I think we would probably argue against the system more strongly than anybody because we have done so much work to understand how it works. And we know the inefficiencies. We know the problems. We know how it's going to lead to even bigger problems and probably lead to disaster. So we're not advocates for the system, but we, we, we are acknowledging the, not permanency, but the institutionalized effect of the system and how hard it is to overthrow. I mean, when you think about revolutions, you can probably name the top 10 rev revolutions in history because there's probably only been 10 successful ones, right? Can anybody name the thousand revolutions that didn't? 
that didn't succeed? No, because they're they're in the dustbin of history, right? And and the reason they're in the dustbin of history is because it's really, really, really hard to pull off. So the dollar milkshake theory, something that we have defined in a playlist to start here on our YouTube channel. It's one of your original presentations. Uh, it's still quite good, maybe not quite as uh, refined and colorful as, 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 as they've become, but there's also a few other videos associated with that that discuss the Euro dollar markets. But one other thing I wanna uh, put an exclamation on what you just said that comes from the dollar milkshake theory is you're talking about tapering a Ponzi and you know people have also kind of made the comment, well, they'll just stop paying those debts or they'll default on US dollar debts. Well, that doesn't happen without creating immense pain, destroying their own asset values and, and other, other types of ways. But at the same time, and just to be clear, when, when we're seeing the argument around government deficits, specifically in the US and how that leads to weaker dollars and you know, paper money just is getting inflated away. You often make sure people have that grounded understanding. This is number one, a relative game, but that's actually keeping the system running. As as the dollar is weak or you know trending weaker over time, especially in the global markets, it's really just keeping the whole Ponzi going. It's not until something like a decision as rogue as it would be to completely give up on US dollar assets and US dollar debt, that you would start to see a default in those types of things and the demand for dollars increasing, which would make the dollar painfully stronger, which is really your whole point about what leads to the eventual collapse. No, that's actually, uh, that's absolutely right. I think, I think myself and many of the people who, I guess, disagree with my thesis, we all end up at the same destination. I just think it's a much different path to get there. And to those who say, well, why don't you just prepare for the end game and just hold on? That's fine. If you want to do that, that's fine. But again, you know, I have a fiduciary duty to, to manage assets and, uh, you know, not everybody wants to just sit there and hold on and experience the pain of holding on while you, while we eventually get to that destination. And in fact, I think there's a great opportunity to increase your wealth on the on the path to that destination. And it's very possible that if you don't have some kind of assets other than, you know, gold or Bitcoin or whatever it is that you think that that does well in the end game, if you might get liquidated along the way, or you might end up being a distressed seller rather than somebody who benefits. And so I think that's a big part of it. Um, I, you know, it's one thing, you know, to, to, to understand where paradise is at, but, you know, to get through the gates to get there is pretty difficult. This show is provided for entertainment and informational purposes only. It should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. Neither the hosts, guests, nor any funds they may manage intends to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies.